The, re the result of these restrictions, even though they are minute, is to sometimes cause uh, little irregularities that may be difficult to understand if you don't understand how real numbers and how flo floating point representation is implemented with computers. For example, here let's um, do some simple division that we shouldn't be able to do. Divide 1 by 0, this should be undefined, but actually in R, R will do it. It will tell you it's infinity. And similarly, we, we can divide 0 by 0. So let's do that. Here we go, 0 by 0. It's not a number. Again, this is undefined. It doesn't make any sense with, with real numbers and real mathematics. But you can actually do it in a computer. Now, there here are some other restrictions. The smallest non-zero positive number is 2 to the minus 1074th power. So let's see what that comes out to if we try and calculate that in R. So here we do it. And we can tell very small, very small number. The, the, uh, the decimal place has moved over 324 places from here. So we can do that, but let's try to do 1 divided by 2 over this very, very small number. Do we get any sort of, re of a um, value for that? We should, based on the previous example, but we don't. It tells us it's infinitely large, which again doesn't make sense in conjunction with the previous example. Similarly, if we take a look at the largest number, the largest number that can be represented is 2 raised to the 1023rd power. So let's say we try and calculate that in R, which is what we're doing right now, and we get a very large number, uh, e to the 307th, which means this decimal place would be moved over this away, 377 positions. If we increase that just by one, one power that is, we find that we get, again, uh, an answer that says it's just too large. Okay, here's another ex evidence of, of that those little irregularities that we get. Let's start with the very largest number that you can possibly represent, 2 to the 1,023rd power, and then we'll add to that 2 to the 1,022nd and 2 to the 1,021st. Well, when we do that, actually, we get a determinant number. We get a value. Okay, however, if we increase the second one just ever so slightly, we say, okay, this is the largest number, positive number, that can be represented. Let's add this, which is a little bit smaller than the largest, and then add to it again. We find that it says it's an infinite. So the, the cumulative, the uh, results, this basket of results, if you will, seems, they seem to be contradictory or inconsistent with each other. Now, I've even heard people um, criticize the software. They would say, well, if I'm paying $400 for software, I want it to round properly. It, it isn't the software's fault. It's the way the digits are represented in the, uh, in, with this computer architecture. So let's continue. So the smallest number that can be distinguished from 1 is 2 to the minus 52nd power. This is called machine epsilon. So let's play around with this. Let's assign a value to x that is 1 plus this very small, the smallest possible number that can be represented. And we'll see what x turns out to be. In that case, x turns out to be 1. So it doesn't seem to add anything to it. Well, what if we, if x is 1, if we subtract 1 from x, we should get 0, right? but we don't. We get, again, a very small number, but it's positive, and it's more than zero. So again, these two results together don't make sense. Let, let's continue this. So here we increase, we go beyond the smallest possible positive number that can be 
distinguished from one, we'll go up just one, we'll raise it one more power. So we'll say y will be one plus two to the minus 53rd power. Okay, what happens when we do that? Well, when we do that, we again get the value of one for y, which is the same thing, the same thing that we got right here. But unlike this one, now when we subtract one from that number, we do get zero. So it takes some getting used to, and um, it, you get some weird anomalies, I would call them. Generally, results that are smaller in magnitude to 2 raised to the minus 174th power or larger than 2 to the positive 1,023rd power, sometimes called real max, these are called underflow underflow and overflow, and these are the source of uh, sometimes rounding errors that are difficult to understand. So let's continue. So let's talk about how significant digits are, are represented. Using double precision numbers is approximately the same as working with 16 significant digits in base 10. So Arithmetic with integers will be exact for values that are in between minus 2 raised to the 53rd power minus 1, that is 2 raised to the 52nd power, or up to 2 raised, positive 2 raised to the 53rd power minus 1. Outside of this range, you're going to get so-called underflow and overflow, that is, you're going to get round-off error. Okay, so those are some anomalies about accuracy, which is one of the issues that we must be concerned with. Now, there's, there's small rounding errors, granted, but nevertheless, they, they are not what you would expect. The other issue that's very important and that we care about when we're talking about uh, programs running efficiently is time. We, we generally measure the efficiency of a program by how long it takes to run to execute the instructions that are in the program. And this can be affected by a, a number of things. The programming language that it's written in, it can be affected by the, uh, the speed, the clock speed of the central processing unit, the CPU. It can be affected by what else your, what other task your computer is performing at the moment. So in R, we have a function, though, that can measure how many CPU seconds, sometimes taken as the equivalent of clock time or clock cycle, cycle time, how many CPU seconds are spent evaluating an expression. We can do this with, this, with the system.time function. Or more generally, the expression proc, proc.time, will tell you how much time you've used on the CPU since the current R session began. So we have, we have a trace of how long we've been in the session. We have a trace of how long each, the execution of each expression or command or function takes, as well as some other time, time unit measures. So let's, let's try this. So here's proc time. So I've been on, on this in this session not very long. So if we run proc time, it, there it is, um, 675, so it's been longer than I thought. Let's do system time. System time is going to specifically measure how fast whatever this expression is. And this expression, you may recall, this is one of the, dense, the prime density functions. And this one is... Uh, generally inefficient, but um, it's not, it doesn't have a lot of records. So we're going to source that off of my computer and we're going to see how long it takes with system time. And uh, actually this one was faster than I thought. This one, uh, this was the first one that ran very quickly. So it took less than a second actually to execute. Okay, so the sum of this user time and the sum of this system time, if you add those two together, that gives you the CPU seconds that were spent evaluating this expression. 
and this was the quick this was the quick uh, prime density function. Elapsed time, on the other hand, this one includes time spent that your computer is spending on other tasks unrelated to the R session per se. Now, the time taken to run a program, it depends on a number of things. It's not a linear function, really. It depends on the nature of the inputs. Um, for example, the time taken to sum a vector or to sort a vector depends on how long the vector is. It, it also depends on your desired accuracy tolerance level. When we come back, we'll look at another example that will demonstrate uh, how the, the nature of the inputs can affect time.